come. Now is the time to worship. Come. Now is the time to give your heart. Come. Just as you are to worship. Come. Just as you are before your God. Come. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Come. Now is the time to worship. Come. Now is the time to give your heart. Come. Just as you are to worship. Come. Just as you are before. Your God, come. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Willingly we choose to surrender our lives. Willingly our knees will bow. With all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, we gladly choose you now. Come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your Morning, Northview. Man, it is so good to see all of you this morning. Isn't God good? Man, he is so good. I mean, let's just say thank you, Jesus, right now. I had to get that out of me. I got to tell you, I've been here for an hour and a half and about to bust out of my seams. I'm just so excited about this morning. What a great weekend the Lord has provided for us. And when you think about all the good works he has done through the body here at Northview over the last 50 years, and we have people here today who have been there since that beginning, and I'm just humbled by that and so thankful for all the work you have done in helping us and following the Lord and getting us to this point. Just praise God for your faithfulness to Him. We just love you so much. We've got a great morning plan for you. We've got a, a lot of our uh, former elders are going to be here and, uh, and be speaking and, and serving, and it's just wonderful to be with everybody. We're going to get things started off. Our brother Les is going to come up and pray for us and get things started, and uh, then we're just going to get right into continuing our worship and praising Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, we give you glory. We're so grateful for just life and our freedom and for what Jesus did at the cross. We thank you, God, for this uh, wonderful congregation, for the years, for every soul that's been converted, for every message that's been preached, for everyone that's served. And, and we just give you the glory, and we pray, God, that you'll use this body and to your glory, to spread the word of your kingdom. And we just pray, Lord, that you'll uh, just be with us today. We're thankful for the folks that have worked so hard so many years. And we pray, Lord, for Cody and his family. We pray for the eldership now. And we pray, God, that we can all just live our lives unashamedly as Jesus followers with nothing to hide, nothing to prove, nothing to gain, nothing to fear. And Lord, we look forward to that great reunion. When we see the Lord on his throne high and lifted up, we can all be one there. 
Thank you for this day. Thank you for this congregation. Please bless this service to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Les. So how about getting on your feet for just a little bit? Let us worship the Father.
sentiment, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You know, one thing about the Holy Bible I, I just find so fascinating are when you read the truths in the Old Testament and then you look at how they connect in our, in our New Testaments. And, and it's just so encouraging for me to see how giving God's people have been all through you know, these thousands of years that they gave because they gave out of an over, overflowing of joy out of their hearts for what God has done for them. Of course, you know, a lot of their worship and celebrations were about what God had done for them, taking them out of Egypt, right, and parting the Red Sea and all of that, and then bringing them into the promised land. And, and of course, we celebrate, you know, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. So you have in the Old Testament when they're building the temple and all the people will bring everything that they could, you know, things that they had to, to build this temple and just extremely generous. And then you have this story over in Mark 14 and it says, Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money in the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small carpet copper coins worth only a few cents calling his disciples to him jesus said truly i tell you this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others they all gave out of their wealth but she out of her poverty put in everything all she had to live on so you see our our giving comes from deep within and we do it because God is a giving God. He gave us everything he had when he gave us his one and his only son. So as we give and we ask God to bless our offerings, which I believe he has, um, let's just remember that you're never going to outgive God, <laughs> no matter how generous you are. But you give because of God and because of how generous he is. Would you pray with me, please? Our Father and our God, we are just humbled by serving such a holy, merciful, graceful God who gives and gives abundantly to us and to his people and gave us his one and only son that we could one day have that hope of eternity with him. We are just at awe of your goodness, your mercy, and your grace. We thank you for how you have blessed Northview over these last 50 years, and we pray that as long as this world is here, you will continue to work through the people of Northview to bring about great things in your kingdom for your good purpose and for the glory of Christ our Lord. And it's his name I pray, amen. So now we're going to be blessed by our brother Haas coming up and leading our worship. All right. If you want to stand, if you're able to stand, let's stand together and sing these songs. You know, it's, it's said a long time ago, you know, oh, back in the day, right? Well, listen, these are still the days that Elijah lived in, that Moses lived in, when the people were delivered. We're still in God's time. Amen? So let's sing this song together. These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of his servant, Moses. Yeah. 
Jubilee, Northview's year of Jubilee. 50 years Northview's been serving God faithfully. I've been tasked with looking at the past and as I was thinking about this, I couldn't help but to think about the tradition of how stones have always been used throughout history and in the Bible to represent the past. They've been used this way in several different ways, from colleges to explorers like Lewis and Clark as they marked their way through unknown territory, or maybe the Battle of Gettysburg, or even famous people such as Abraham Lincoln. And it's this idea that stones throughout history, including scriptures, have been used to memorialize important events and days. One of the places in Scripture that this occurs is in the book of Joshua. The Israelites are going to the promised land, and when they come up against the Jordan River, this obstacle that was in front of them, God once again miraculously parts the water. See, he parted the water on the way out of Egypt and into the promised land. Joshua 1 through 5 says that the Lord said for them to do this. He said, go into the middle of the Jordan and in front of the ark and the Lord your God. Each of you must pick up one stone and carry it on your shoulder. Twelve stones in all, one for each of the tribes of Israel. Joshua had them build a memorial to God because of the stones. As each of the representatives picked up their stone in the middle of the Jordan, I can imagine some of the thoughts that were going through their mind as they were entering the promised land, especially those that were older, that had been with Joshua for several years in the wilderness. Maybe they were thinking back to the dangers that they had faced and the enemies and the tribes that had attacked them. Or maybe the long, hot days in the desert, wondering if they were ever going to survive. And maybe even they were remembering those that had lost along the way. The elders and children who had become too weak to continue. Or the friends and family who had succumbed to the rigors of the wilderness. And who would not be joining them in the promised land. See, Joshua knows that remembering is important. He knows that it, made, that it took a miracle for them to cross the Jordan, which is what makes these next verses all the more powerful. He said, we will use these stones to build a memorial. In the future, your children are going to ask you, what do these stones mean? And I like this. They remind us. 
They spur us on to remember the past as we continue to move forward. These stones will stand as a memorial among the people of Israel forever. And they carried them to the place where they camped the night and constructed the memorial there. With this simple decree, a pile of rocks on a shore would have been transformed into a monument of living memories for the people of Israel who passed along every day and saw those rocks. They would have been reminded of God's gracious and mighty acts for the generations. See, God calls his people to celebrate what he's done for them and how he's led them to where they are. And there's strength and courage in knowing that we can look back and remind ourselves of the great things that God has done and that he has given us the victory. I look at some of these photos, and I don't have photos of all of the original 24 members. But I look at these photos and I think the amount of courage and faith it took for them to step out of their comfort zone, 23 individual, 24 individuals, to form what we have here 50 years later. So as we were thinking about how to commemorate this day, the idea of the stones kept coming up. Today we have five members that may or may not be in these pictures that were there the very first day that Northview met. Nancy Steichleather, Pam Manus, Betty Mitchell, Belinda Jacobs, and Pam Henderson. To honor their faith and courage, we're going to be building our own stones. We've ordered a fountain that will be placed in memory of the original members here at Northview. Now, before I click the next thing, I want to apologize right now to Pam Henderson. Let me go on record of saying your dad is the one that created this list a long time ago. And I guess he forgot that you were there. That's why I keep saying 23 instead of 24, because I found out this morning that you were there. I often wondered, I thought maybe you were sick or something. <laughs> the top of the fountain, and Pam, we're going to take care of this. The top of the fountain will be engraved with all of the members that were there that first Sunday morning. Now, as we thought through this, we wanted to not just have a fountain, but we wanted to create a space that could be used today as a living memorial. So we added a couple stone benches that will be there as a place of reflection and prayer. This will be located right outside the teen room where the brick pavers are located. Now I go to the brick pavers because we realized that over the last 50 years, it's taken more than just those people to lead Northview to where it is. So because of that, we're going to remove some of the brick pavers as well. Here's why I have to apologize to Claude, also known as Cloud, the Norse Viking. Each of the former ministers and elders will have their bricks that have been laser etched with their names. Claude, yours is coming fixed. <laughs> Go on record as saying this wasn't our mistake, it was theirs. So we're starting a new tradition that as a minister or as an elder moves on to other work or to retire, one of the pavers will be removed and theirs will be added again as a living memorial to the people and what God has done to Northview. Now let me be clear, this is not a memorial for the people whose names are etched on the stones or the, the fountain. This is a memorial of what God has done through his people at Northview. Yes. 
and the amount of faith and courage it took to get us to where we are. So that when our children ask, what do those stones mean? We can tell them how God worked through his people and how he continues to work through us today. Now, when I was, I was thinking about this for the last part of my 10 minutes, I couldn't help but to notice the similarities between what we're doing and the Vietnam Wall. The Vietnam Wall has 58,318 names etched on it of people who were died in the war. And in the past decades, people from all over go to that wall. They go there as a sense of healing, a sense of pride, a sense of reflection. No one ever really would have predicted what this wall has become. Over 400,000 items have been left at that wall. Rings, letters, a motorcycle, football helmets, sneakers, medals, a helicopter blade, just to name a few. While these physical items that are placed at the base of this wall have important emotional or social meaning to those who placed it there, physical objects are not enough to tell the full story of what happened. It takes a living voice to put flesh to the grief and reveal what happened to show what really occurred. That's what the wall represents with the names. There was a journalist who followed one particular Vietnam vet. His story is not pleasant. In 1969, at the age of 20, he was serving, and his best friend was killed right in front of him. The next week, their squad completely annihilated and destroyed the North Vietnamese squad. And as kind of a trophy or to honor his best friend, he took a picture from one of the Vietnamese and kept it in a box in his closet. And that box haunted him. He had PTSD severely and he had to go to all kind of counseling and stuff, but eventually he was ready. He asked his wife to come to one of the counseling sessions. He opened the box, showed the letter that he had written to the family of, those, of that Vietnamese person. And they decided to take it to the wall. And when they took it to the wall the next day, he said he felt like he was a new person. Because he was able to give up the strife and anguish that he had been dealing with for so long in his life. The physical stone of the, monu- of the memorial that you see in front of you was just a place for people to bring their grief and pain. But it took a living voice telling his story to be a witness of the power of the memorial wall itself. For us to remember, to let go and experience the forgiveness that is, it was involved there. Jesus himself knew of this as well. He knew the importance of living voices. That's why as he prepared his 12 at the last, his last supper, when he gathered them together, gave them some bread and wine, something physical to remember them by, but what he was really do was doing was getting them ready for the mission that was before them. The mission of being sent out after his death and resurrection. He was shaping them into living stones. Witnesses to the memory of Jesus and the message of forgiveness and healing that comes along with that. We too are living stones. There are people that drive by our building every day. They see our infrastructure and they think, boy, that's a nice pile of rocks. It's a nice piece of drywall and some glass. Looks really pretty. 
And that's why it's so important for us to come here to get filled with the Spirit and take the Spirit out into the community that we serve. Jesus is calling us today to be those living stones to witness to the forgiveness that he has blessed us with and the grace that we are so honored to have. And if we as this body were to do that today, not only would our church be transformed, but lives changed because of God's love and his voice. God of Israel, there's no God like you in heaven or earth below. Oh Lord God of Israel, there's no God like you in heaven above. Oh Lord God of Israel. Recently, 
at a, at a training seminar. We started a recovery program at our church uh, just this past Thursday. was our first night. But we went through training. And one of the things that he said is this. And it kind of connects with what you were talking about. Through the whole wilderness. The whole wilderness. They talked about, I wish we could go back to Egypt. Right? Did they say that ever? The moment they entered the promised land. Now they, they were on a journey. They wanted to return. But once they got where God was taking them, they didn't want to go back. And the only time that they remembered it was once a year when they were like, that was the past. They didn't remember it like, let's go back. So, you know, even the Old Testament tells us not to, you know, think about, oh, what, were those days great? There are good days, and we need to remember those things. The failures, the, the successes, but we don't get to be stuck there. So you may put a... A, a stone in the ground, but it's just a building block on the future, right? Don't just stand and look over your shoulder in the back. We look at that and say, all right, we know where we're headed. Let's stand together and sing the song before communion. <coughs> Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall. Good morning. So good to 
see so many beautiful, friendly faces, mostly uh, old friends after so many years or, of being here and sharing such great friendships. Uh, Cliff mentioned a little while ago that he was, how did you say it? You were about to bust out of your something. And uh, uh, Melly and I came in Friday afternoon and we've kind of felt that way uh, ever since we got here. Just being surrounded by beautiful friends and those precious times together and, and uh, uh, you know, being away for a year or so and coming back and, and uh, we've been doing that back and forth for several years now. It's, uh, it's always so joyous. And uh, th this, uh, this building, I know each of us is just, uh, we show it in different ways. Uh, we're not busting out maybe quite like Cliff is. And, uh, a lot of sanguines in the room like my wife, they're wanting to just, you know, let it, let it come out of their mouths. And, and uh, some of us, on the other hand, are a little more, a little more reserved, but uh, it's, it's there. And uh, just that, uh, that joy is, uh, is something to share. Uh, so what's the source of that joy? Can I take just a, just a minute, if I can get my phone to cooperate, get my thumb to cooperate? Huh. Well, it would fail at just the wrong time, wouldn't it? I've got a Bible in here somewhere. That phone hasn't done that in about a month. Gave it the perfect opportunity, huh? Let me go in the back door here. Okay. Uh, the source of that joy, let's, let's read a few verses out of John 10. Jesus said, I speak to you eternal truth. I am the gate for the flock. All those who broke in before me are thieves who came to steal, but the sheep never listened to them. I am the gateway. To enter through me is to experience life, freedom, and satisfaction. A thief has only one thing in mind. He wants to steal, to slaughter, to destroy. But I have come to give you everything in abundance. More than you expect. Life in its fullness until you overflow. I am the good shepherd who lays down my life as a sacrifice for the sheep. And sorry, here we go again. Okay, so Christ came to live among us, to teach us how to love, uh, and to give his life so that we could have eternal life. But not only eternal life, he offers us the gift of, of an abundant life, both now and eternally. So let's celebrate now his life and his death by honoring his sincere desire to give us life overflowing both now and forever. Let's pray together, please. Jesus, thank you for teaching us how to love for giving us the path for eternal life and for offering us a life here, overflowing with joy. In your precious name we pray, amen. been the Lord who's on our side. Had he not been the Lord who's on our side, the anger of the enemy would have swallowed us alive. Had he not been the Lord who's on our side.
It is good to be here this morning. It's good to share our love for each other. But it's good that we're here to share our love for our Jesus Christ and Lord. First Peter chapter 2, verses 22 and 24. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on that tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you, we have all been healed. Christ suffered not for any wrong that he had done. He didn't lie, he didn't deceive. When he was being jeered and insulted, he didn't threaten, he didn't answer in return. He didn't suffer and die because of anything he had done, because of any sins that he had committed. But he took upon himself our sins and bore them on his body on that cross. Christ died and rose from death to make our death to sin and our life afterwards possible through him. Would you bow with me? Father, as we come together to share in this cup, representing Christ's shed blood on the cross, we praise Jesus, our Redeemer, our Messiah. Thank you, God, for your perfect love and for Jesus Christ, our perfecter. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you don't mind, let's go ahead and stand before Cody comes up. What can walk show? Away my sin, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can
What a blessing it is to be here this morning. I've got to say, it's a weird feeling. I've been here for a couple of months celebrating a 50-year history. And to be completely transparent, it's hitting me much differently than I anticipated it would. Uh, I'm incredibly humbled to be in this position. Um, I feel incredibly inadequate. Um, and yet, I, I have the benefit of standing on the shoulders of giants. And I'm so grateful for that. Thank you. <clears throat> I, I'm grateful that we have the opportunity to take the time to recognize and appreciate the way that God has moved in the past. Mike's making fun of me for crying again. <laughs> uh, I'm thankful that we uh, are able to look for ways that God is at work here in the present. Uh, I'm grateful that we have the opportunity to dream about all that God will do in the future and to respond with praise to God for who he is, what he has done, is doing, and will continue to do. Admittedly, I've still got a lot to learn about Northview and what God has done here over the last 50 years. I've only been here a couple of months, but I've heard stories and I see the fruit of what God has done through his people at this congregation. And all of that, the culmination of the last 50 years has led us here. All of the people, the activities, the ministries, the prayers, the services, the relationships, all of it has contributed to what Northview is today, and that is cause for celebration. But while there's a lot to celebrate, there are other things that probably aren't cause for celebration. Realistically, no group of people that has come together and been together for 50 years has done so without encountering some conflict. No church has lasted this long without making mistakes. Personally, I could rattle off a whole list of mistakes that I've already made and I just got here. <laughs> In 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12, we find Samuel looking around at all that God has done, and it says this, Samuel then took a large stone and placed it between the towns of Mizpah and Jeshana. He named it Ebenezer, which means the stone of help. For he said, up to this point, the Lord has helped us. He sets up this large stone of help. He names it Ebenezer, and he declares proudly and confidently, up to this point, God has helped us. When Samuel makes that statement, he's in a bit of a precarious situation, He's leading Israel in this war against the Philistines, and it's not going well. They had just lost the first battle, and in an attempt to turn the tide, they decided that they would take the Ark of the Covenant with them into the second battle. 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 3 says, After the battle was over, the troops, re the troops retreated to their camp, and the elders of Israel asked, Why did the Lord allow us to be defeated by the Philistines? They said, let's bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from Shiloh. If we carry it into battle with us, it will save us from our enemies. Theoretically, that sounds like a good thing to do. It seems like that would be something that God would be pleased with. But, unfortunately, the people of Israel weren't so much focused on the presence of God being with them in the Ark of the Covenant. It's not that they were turning to their relationship with the Lord to sustain them in this battle. Instead, they were viewing this object, this Ark of the Covenant, as their key to victory, as if it was the thing that would bring them power. Their focus was on the object, not on the Lord. They were expecting God to basically just grant their, their wishes like a, a magic genie. This decision to carry the ark into battle was not about reliance on God, but was rather about self-preservation, the acquisition of power. And it didn't work. They lost the second battle too. And not only that, but they lost the ark of the covenant. The Philistines took control of it and decided to keep it, at least for a little bit. The issue with the Israelites is that the ark had become a bit of an idol for them which is strange to say. The ark was a good thing. It was a gift given to them by God. But even good things can become idols. And that's what we see played out here. It's no secret that the nation of Israel repeatedly struggled with idolatry throughout the Old Testament. Over and over and over again, the Hebrew people turned to someone or something other than God to find their value and their identity. 
Sometimes it's literal idols. Sometimes it's people. Sometimes it's power. Really, it, there's all kinds of things. There's no end to that list. They were an idolatrous people, or in other words, they were people. This is exactly what's happening here in the early days of Samuel's tenure as judge over Israel. They've taken the Ark of the Covenant, this good gift from God, and they've made an idol of it. But that's not the only idol that they're dealing with at this time. They're also worshiping other gods. In 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 3, Samuel says to the people, if you want to return to the Lord with all your hearts, get rid of your foreign gods and your images of Ashtoreth. Turn your hearts to the Lord and obey Him alone. Then He will rescue from the Philistines. And that's what the people did. They got rid of their images of Ashtoreth and Baal and decided that they would only worship Yahweh, only the God of Israel. And it works out for them. They win their next battle against the Philistines and they don't have to deal with that anymore. It's a great picture of what God can do for His people. Now, that's not to say that God is our magic genie who will do whatever we want as long as we worship Him the right way. We don't want to fall into the same traps as the Israelites. But what this story does teach us about God is that He will show up when His people look for Him. When people are willing to lay things down in order to pursue God, He reveals Himself. He shows up. God is constantly fighting for our attention, trying to make Himself known And yet we miss it so often. Even though God is revealing himself to us all the time, whether it be through scripture, relationships, creation, or whatever else it may be, we manage to miss it. But on the rare occasion that a group of people set everything else aside and pursue God wholeheartedly, he shows up. In this particular story, he shows up in the way that the people want him to, and he's with them as they claim victory over the Philistines. That doesn't necessarily mean that God always shows up in the ways that we want Him to. He will show up, but it might not turn out how we think it will. God might have something different in store for us. The time may not be right. There could be something better just around the corner. We don't control God's plans, and we know that He doesn't concede to our expectations. It's up to us to live up to His expectations, not the other way around. And that's where we find ourselves as a church. That is the moment that I believe we're in. We look around at all that's happened in this body over the last 50 years, and we can confidently say, up to this point, the Lord has helped us. And now, we wait. But this is no normal, passive waiting. We wait actively We pursue God in our waiting. We look for the spaces in which he is at work, and we step into them. It's no secret that Northview is a church in transition. Things have been shifting around here for a couple of years, from what I understand. The transformation team discovered needs in the community that we can and should meet. They discovered questions within the congregation that need to be addressed, They hired this weird new guy that we can't quite figure out and we don't know what to do with him. (laughs) But while Northview is a church in transition, and while we are waiting to see exactly where God will lead us, we're at work. I was talking to Bob last night about how encouraged Sarah Catherine and I have been to see that this congregation was already moving before we arrived. There was no need to wait for a preacher to show up. It was already time to get busy, to get active in the community, to narrow the focus of what we do here in this building, and to create more spaces for heaven and earth to become one. Throughout the life of Jesus, we constantly see him turning to the Father to find rest and guidance. That doesn't mean that ministry slowed down. It just means that his ministry flowed from a deep river of peace and love fed by his relationship with the Father. And it's that same river that we're swimming in right now. We're still learning how to swim. We've got our floaties on, trying to figure it out, floating along but we are learning to immerse ourselves fully in the will of the Father, consecrating ourselves fully to Him and His will for our collective church life. We pursue God in new ways. We strive to cultivate a deeper relationship with the divine than we ever have before. We're developing eyes to see the kingdom around us. 
We want to find our life existing fully within the flow of the Spirit. The stressful thing about that is that we don't know exactly where that leads, but we can look around and confidently say, up to this point, the Lord has helped us. And because of that, we have confidence that He will continue to do just that. So yes, we are waiting, but in the waiting, we experience God in new ways. We learn of His faithfulness and His patience, and it's that relationship with the Lord which we continue to develop that sustains us as we build upon the foundation of this church, as we continue to stand upon the shoulders of the giants who have gone before us. It's that relationship with the Lord that sustains us as we serve our community. It's the Lord who decides where we go and when we move. Right now, He's shaping us. He's forming us into the church that we need to be, into the people that He wants us to be. There are times in which that refinement process is painful, and there are times in which it's incredibly exciting. It's usually some strange combination of the two. But as we learn to exist within the flow of the Spirit, as we swim within the river of God's love, we're plunged into an ocean of goodness that is the result of following where He leads. That is the moment that Northview finds itself in, learning to exist more fully within God's presence, more fully aware of His kingdom, of His lead. We're still learning how to do that. We always will be. But it's an exciting time to discover where it is that God is going to be leading us. Pray with me. Father, we stand before you humbled and grateful, not just for, for the incredible 50 years of history here at Northview, but for the thousands and thousands of years of the history of your people, the people that we commune with throughout time and space, the people that you somehow connect us to that is only possible through you. Lord, teach us to see with your eyes. Help us to see the kingdom around us. Help us to, to know how to bring heaven and earth closer together each and every day. Lord, I pray that you would lead us. Show us how to develop a relationship with you and to be aware of what it is that you're leading us to do. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Man, Brother Cody, we're going to sing this song and then our brother... Claude will be coming up here reading scripture for us. Oh Lord my God, when I am awesome wonder, consider
Old school, Joey. Old school. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to preach. I'm not one of the speakers, but uh, it, it, it occurred to me when Mike was doing his lesson, um, how many that, you know, I'm, I'm up here to read a, a scripture, but it occurred to me that when Mike did his scripture, that he read that, that that's one of the three times in the Bible that God parted the waters. And I don't know about you, I'm not as smart as everybody, I guess, but um, you probably don't know. I mean, we all know Moses, part of the water. We all know, now we know Joshua. Thanks, Mike, sharing that with us. But Ezekiel did it too in uh, Second Kings. And I, I just thought about that, about God's word is ever fresh, is ever new, every morning. And as I listen, we, get, we heard from Joshua today, we heard from John, we heard from Second Peter, we heard from Cody, what were Second Samuel. <laughs> um, so uh, now you're going to hear from Hebrews 13, and um, it's not probably a scripture you read a lot, um, but, uh, and I don't even know why, Rick, how you going to work it in your sermon? <laughs> You're not, okay. <laughs> so why don't, some reason on the program it's in red, so. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to read it for you. It's God's word and it's, it's, uh, it's new every morning. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work, to do his will, working in you what is well, pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I got to make one more comment. So, <laughs> Joey and Bob did more coats. That, that, that's all right. And Cody, he doesn't wear a coat either. But Rick's going to wear a coat. So one of the pictures you saw up there was Jim Smith. And when I became an elder, Jim Smith told me, you have to wear a coat. <laughs> so it was easy for me because I grew up in a culture where you wore coats to church on Sunday. Anyway, I'm sorry, Cliff. That's fine. Actually, it was a coat and a tie, just to be complete. <laughs> hey, the, and, and you read that scripture because it fits so well with this song that we're about to sing. So why don't we stand, get on our feet before Rick gets up here. This is a wonderful, wonderful song about um, the Ancient of Days. Mm, blessing and honor, glory and power, be to the Ancient of Days.
Is it going to work? All right. So, yeah, it is so good to be up here and to be able to talk to you today and speak about the future coming up. And, um, you know, I'm up here by default. I'm the oldest of the elders right now. So, <laughs> that, so I get honored to be up here to talk to you all today. But I appreciate that. I've been here uh, since 81, Carolyn and me came. So if you figure that up, that's 80% of the history. Now, when, when we were talking about who's going to speak, I just assumed I was doing the past since I lived most of the past here. But I, got the, I did get the future. So, um, and I got to thinking about the future, and I got to thinking, what about the 100th? What about the next 50 years? So I got to thinking, that of us three, if we just go by age and no lightning strikes, you know, obviously I'm not going to be here for that one. If Mike is here, it's going to be ugly, but he, he might... <laughs> He might make it. He might make it. But Cody will be a young 78, you know, so that's realistic. He's probably, so I want you to eat good and go to the gym so you can be up here at the 100th, okay? So you're the, you're the only one of us. You, you got it. All right. I got I to gotta fix a little bit of a, a mistake by Mike. We, we're getting all befuddled over the number of people that are here today that were at the uh, uh, original first day. There were six. There were there's six here today. Betty is here. Where's Betty? Manus. Betty Manus. Yo, we left you off that list, okay? <laughs> so there's six here. Now, I want to add one more that I found out about that's in the mix, okay? So I was talking to somebody this past week. I'll tell you in a minute. And uh, I said, well, how long have you been here? He said, from the beginning. And I said, well, well you, but you weren't on the list. You weren't the first day. He said, no, I came one month after that. Would well, Duke Hedrick stand up? We have... <laughs> so honorable mention to Duke, but won't get on the fountain soon. All right. So... We got one more stone to talk about. Undoubtedly the most important stone in the Bible, and you see it behind me here. Luke 24, 1. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And we all know that without this miraculous event in history, there would be no reason for us to be here today. He would just have been another man that died on the cross in the story. But because Jesus defeated death, we that are in Christ will defeat death also and receive our new heavenly body as he did when he returns. The empty tomb with that two-ton stone rolled back by the power of God is why Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 15.3. Ta-da! For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day also according to the scriptures. And not only are we told what is the most important, Jesus tells us how we should act as his disciples as we go about spreading the gospel. When asked what is the greatest commandment, Matthew 22, Jesus replies, Verse 37, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So folks, if we can just remember these two scriptures and maintain this attitude in all that we do, we know we're doing the will of God. The devil loves it when we get bogged down in details and forget what is the most important. So we know our task at hand. We are all in agreement that bringing the lost to relationship with God through Christ is the goal. Now, how can we do a better job to accomplish this over the next 50 years is the question, and what is our vision for doing our part right here and now to grow the kingdom? We've heard all the doom and gloom about religion in America, the fast decline that is expected in the churches of Christ. And we've even seen our numbers drop as well as our average age here increase. But the elders and ministers do not believe that that trend will continue, and we certainly don't plan to just fade away over time. 
Through the IMP process, we ask you what you are passionate about. Where do you see God leading us? What should we as a church family focus on as mission? Across the board, we heard, get outside these walls and be more hands-on in our community. Second, we heard children. Meeting the needs of kids in our back door that find themselves in a cycle of poverty, poor school performance, which ultimately will lead them in a spiral. I think our passion for Hope for Haiti's children made all of us realize that we can make a difference. If we can make a difference in Haiti, why can't we do it here in our backyard, especially when we have one of the most impoverished schools in the county right across the interstate? So with the tremendous leadership of Virginia and over 60 of you that have volunteered there in the past 12 months, that has already started to happen. And And we're even connecting that school to our adopted school in Haiti, uh, of Robert, their pen pals. You know, that is such a godly thing, you know, that you can't, you just have to realize that God's hands are on this. What? Yeah, the, we're doing the joy boxes, right? I'm sorry. Oh, the school is doing, they're helping with the joy boxes. I didn't realize that. Good, very good. The elders feel that this is just the tip of the iceberg. Our goal is to continue to create more opportunities for more of you to use your talents to show the love of Jesus in the community. Look at this as our training facility here to equip you for the battle that's out there. We want people to be looking at us and asking, why are you doing this? And our response should just simply be because that's what Jesus would do. Let our love for others just become a natural part of our DNA here, where it just flows out, because that's just who we are. And with that, we step back, we let God do the work, and hopefully some of these people are going to ask questions. Hopefully they will come and check us out just to see if we really are for, for real here. Now with that comes part two. There is a balance in going outside these walls and keeping our house in order. We also need people with a passion for looking after one another. And many of you do that so well, but to be honest, it goes under the scenes, under the radar. <clears throat> if your skill set is encouraging and making sure no one falls through the crack here, we appreciate that very, very much. Just remember, we're in this together. We're in this together. Our expectation is that everyone has at least one or more roles in God's kingdom. We want you to make a difference in the life of someone else, either inside or outside these walls. Everyone. All right. I said children. Every from uh, 12th grade and down to come up here on the stage. We want this moment of all the kids up here, a photo op here. <laughs> so kids, come on up and I'll kind of talk as you come, but I want you all to set up here on the stage. If you can, and parents, bring your small ones and sit with them, it's fine. If you're pregnant and expecting a baby, Alex, come up here. So, <laughs> Candace, Candace, where are you? Candace, you can come up too. Candace is expecting too. But, so as they come, we have to realize when these families from Third Creek or wherever hear about us and come to visit, we need to be ready for them. If our house isn't in order with the, the, the young people, they may walk in and turn around and go right back out. When they ask, what do you have for our children? We need to have a children's ministry in place that is first class. Taking care of children has to start with our own. It has to start with our own. Lori and Pam do a great job with classes, but we need to expand this to include parent support groups, enhanced check-in protocols, uh, you know, uh, 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 making our uh, playground and property kid-friendly. We need to show that we make children and families a priority here and that it is very obvious from the time they enter the parking lot. 
We are in the process of evaluating this, and, and there is going to be some exciting things ahead about the children's ministry here. But you look, and this is certainly not all the kids, but this is the future. This is the future right here. And I think it's so cool. Well, let me do this. All right. I'm going to, I have a short video, a very short a page. Where are you at? There you are. All right. She doesn't know I'm doing this, but I'll, I'll show it to you, and then I've got a couple things to say. But this will kind of um, lead into what I got to say about the kids. <laughs> Okay. So what's what's so that wasn't prompted at all. We were sitting there at the house one night watching TV and she breaks out in this and we're like, what in the world? And then we realized we had had her here at five o'clock on a Sunday afternoon and she heard Cliff. I, I didn't know you were gonna lead that song today, but uh, she heard Cliff and by golly, she memorized those words, that little bit, and author of salvation. I'm like, what in the world? So uh, another cool thing with, with Paisley, the, the, this past Sunday, Kathy Kennedy gave her a lollipop. Where's Kathy at? Right there. All right. Kathy came up to me and said, I gave Paisley a lollipop. And I said, well, great. She said, yeah, but she said, thank you, Miss K Kathy. And Kathy, I'm like, whoa, so she knows who you are, Kathy. And Kathy said, yeah, that's, that's really cool. I asked Kathy, Afterwards, you know, I was talking to her and I said, well, who gave you the lollipop? She said, Miss Kathy. I said, well, how did you know her name? She said, well, she taught me and she gave me a m m mask a year ago. And I said, well, cool. So you remembered all that. All right. Now, the other, so I said to her, I said, well, tell me another adult here that you interact with. I, and she understood that. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, who do you hang out with some at, at, at church? I said, well, the Sprinkle Girls. And I said, well, that's good that you remember the Sprinkle Girls. I said, but they're teenagers. Let's think of somebody older that's an adult. And she said, uh, Mr. Chris. And I said, oh, okay. And I said, was it tall Chris that helps Harper's dad with AV in the back? And she said, no. And I said, well, was it Jenya's husband, Chris? Kind of muscular? And she said, no. And I said, okay. So it must be short, a little bit rounded, Chris. And she said, yeah, that's him. <laughs> Chris Mitchell, Chris, Chris, so, um, so uh, I don't know where Chris is, but um, so I said, well, what do you do with Chris sometimes? We welcome people. So she goes out there and sometimes helps to, to welcome. So I use her as an example of all these kids. They are absorbing everything when they come. You are such a big, and I can see it in her. It just, it's just amazing. At such a young age, take Am I, did, did I go off? Back up here, maybe. So, um, so yeah, it's just great to me that we are a village truly, and we need to take care of our kids. And when these other families come in, because we do want that's one of our focuses moving forward. We're trying to decrease the age here and bring in these young families. So, we want our children's ministry to be first class for these kids and for the ones to follow. So we appreciate everybody in all that they're doing to make this happen. I'm so glad to see all the folks that have come back here today. And what's cool about that, you're working in the kingdom somewhere else. So Northview has just been a little part of your journey. And we are so grateful that you had that time here because I think everybody that's here is the providence of God for whatever time. As long as we keep everybody grounded in their faith so they leave and serve in the kingdom. I don't know if this building will be here. May not 50 years from now. Some hotel chain could come in and offer us a buku amount of money and we're out of here. You know, So who knows what it will be 50 years from now. But I would like these kids to be working in the kingdom somewhere. And so we've got to keep setting that foundation for them. I appreciate it. I'm rambling. I'll get off and let Cliff have it. Thank you. All right, kids. You're out of here. Y'all need to see it.
have two more songs left. Hoss, come on up here, man. I really missed you. It's so good seeing you. It is so good to see you. So we got two more songs, and uh, what a great day. And then um, we'll be closed. I think Brother Rick Bergen's going to be closing us out today, right? So uh, what a perfect song um, to, uh, to follow up all of what Rick had to say. And ladies, I uh, need you to start us off here. Mm, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' love. Yeah.
good morning. Wow. Wow. I, I got the coat memo, Claude. <laughs> and, and after last week, I was warned not to go off script, so uh, some of you will understand. Uh, it is truly humbling uh, to be here. Cody, I've been here 13 years and I'm still humbled to be standing before this group, uh, to be part of what God is doing here at Northview. And, and I, I too feel inadequate. But I think the amazing thing is, is that God uses inadequate people. Uh, he, he has us here for his purpose. Uh, you know, we, we've talked about the people who've been here 50 years, and that is just amazing. Uh, last week, we had a young family, uh, the Altmans, join us uh, and want to be part of this family. And you know what? They, they are part of what, what God is doing here. Uh, just as much as our 50-year people are part of what God is doing here. Uh, you know, whether you've been here 50 years, one week, Anywhere in between, you have been part of what God has done, is doing, and will do at Northview. We thank you for being part of that. Uh, one of the things we talk about amongst the elders uh, is that God has always brought the right people at the right time for his purposes. And you all have been part of Northview whether it's now or in the past or will be in the future, you have been here at the right time for God to use you. And now some of you God is using somewhere else and we praise God for that. And we look forward to where, who God is gonna to bring to be part of what he is going to do uh, here and in this community and throughout the world, uh, through this body, this family, and through the work that you all have done the the foundation that has been laid um we did uh do want to share from the gene giles family uh just a recognition of of today uh it said thank you for showing us the love of god from the very beginning we are so happy to be celebrating 50 years since the church opened with you all everything is possible through christ sending blessings and prayers god is good amen to that Thank you for, for that recognition. Uh, we are going to have a, a meal following this. Uh, we want to invite everyone to stay to be part of that. They call these closing comments, but closing uh, just does not feel right. Uh, this should not close. I do not want this to end. This is just a continuation of, of what God has started and what God will do uh, through, through you all and has done through you all. So we're going we're gonna to have a prayer, a uh, continuation prayer, uh, and, and we'll offer thanks for the food. Holy Father, uh, just uh, praise you, uh, Father, for the things that you have done, uh, the things you're doing, and the things you will do, Father. Uh, we are humbled to be here, to be part of this, Father. Uh, we thank you for those who have gone before us, Father and have laid the foundation, Father. But none of that would be possible without the cornerstone, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we, we want to build on him, Father, and him alone. And I pray that as we, we go forward from this day, that we shine as lights in this community, Father. We lift him up, that they might see him in the things that we do, and they might glorify you, Father, they may feel your love, Father, your presence as we uh, interact with them on, on a daily basis, Father. May we, we lift you up and may all this community uh, be drawn to you and be transformed because of you, Father. Please uh, be with us, uh, those who are traveling. I pray for safe travels. Thank you so much for the food that you provided, Father. We are are blessed to receive it, and we just give you the glory for that. And Father, thank you for those who have gone before us, Father, and for uh, those who will come, Father. And we just praise you, and we pray all these things in the name of our Savior. Let our church say, Amen. Amen.